Driven from their homes by armed invaders, a few hardy refugees faced the prospect of starting again. They would found a new village deep in the countryside. Huh? With a new settlement established, the first priority was locating a reliable food source. The simplest source was gathering from nature. With a healthy supply of food, the village could start to grow. To do so, it would need more hands to share the work. The new workforce could now turn to the growing village's needs. First, they would build a mill near their food source, so villagers could drop off gathered berries more easily. Work Henday. Next, the growing village would need wood to build with. The growing community now had a steady supply of lumber. To make wood collection easier, villagers could erect a lumber camp near the forest. Thanks to the camp, villagers no longer needed to travel as far to drop off lumber. The village now required additional houses to support its growing population. With additional housing in place, even more villagers could join the workforce. Yeah. But a populous village would soon exhaust the natural food sources. To grow, the community needed dedicated farms. Woodsmen and farmers now kept the village well supplied. Test 
Fortress. Major. Further growth required knowing the countryside and finding more resources. For that, communities employed scouts. Able to move quickly and see great distances, scouts were key to discovering new resources. The most important thing for a scout to locate was a ready source of gold. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. To prevent having to haul all large distances, expanding communities would establish a mining camp near the source of gold. A well-placed camp ensured efficient gold mining. With a good supply of gold, the village was becoming a large town. The signpost of this growth would be the construction of a large landmark. With the landmark in place, the once sleepy village announced itself as a thriving feudal township. The townsfolk had been driven from their homes before, however. This time, they would defend themselves. The first step would be constructing a barracks for infantry. Each timber theos. Each a worker. Once it had a barracks, the town could establish a standing force of soldiers. Simple infantrymen armed with spears were a common choice for these militias. Each will be a self-ending. Each will a hewer with off where a thaff. That she may be your timbran. Each timbra theos. There are your worth. There are your worth. Gongenda Acreham. Each a worker. What third face? Each is saying, yes. What third faith, eh? You win day off. Yes, sir. Far end they know. Yarrow to work. So now. Each a will a hewer will do. 
What's her fit, eh? Go on, game day, no. And you work, eh? You win day up. Yes, sir. Eh? With two hala. Each will a delta. And you work, eh? Yes, sir, delta. Eh? What's her fit, eh? Each will pay us the. Yes, sir. With two hala. And you work it. Got we got? I said that. The town now had a militia and could look to reclaim the lands lost to invasion. The invaders had blocked the road north with a stout palisade. Although spears were of little use against these walls, the militia could burn down the obstacle with torches. open, the militia could now reclaim their lands in the north. First, the spearmen had to deal with a lone sentry. Advancing aggressively, the militia eliminated the enemy sentry. The invaders had a small cavalry camp guarding the road, but the militia was ready to attack. effective against cavalry, allowing the militia to win the day. All that remained was to destroy the invaders' stables. Invaders' cavalry post was destroyed, but other enemy positions awaited further up the road. Hostile archers defended the next camp, which would put spearmen at a disadvantage. The township needed cavalry of its own to deal with this, and so would need to build stables. To deploy that cavalry quickly, the town needed to build their stables near the front lines. Fortunately, friendly villagers came out of hiding and joined the effort. 
Garu up, come on. With stables in place, the town could field horsemen of its own. Betis Lista. Yes, this command day. A your yard. It will pay itself in day. Shay attendee! No! Let us Uskan. Each a for you. The town now had a rapid like cavalry, skilled at harassing slower targets, such as archers. eliminated the enemy archers and moved on to destroying the archery range itself. The invaders' archers and their camp were destroyed. A final enemy emplacement remained, one fortified with palisades and defended by spearmen. To deal with this target, the town would need longbowmen. First, they needed to build archery ranges in the area regained from the invaders. Once more, friendly villagers arrived to help. With several archery ranges in place, the town could add longbowmen to its forces. Straight. Straight. 
A strong force of archers could eliminate enemy spearmen at a distance, so long as they took the proper position. Poised on a cliff top, the longbowman would be protected from an infantry charge. The last of the invaders fell to the resurgent homegrown population. Now that their lands were free of enemies, the town could take the next step in its growth and become a powerful medieval city. Here too, the erection of a great landmark would be the signpost of this growth. Farendidu. 
where a few lowly refugees had founded a small village, now rose a mighty city. From there would grow an empire. Some events leave a deep mark on history, but none on the land. This is the site of the Battle of Hastings. After almost a thousand years, no traces of the bloody conflict can be seen. But here, the fate of England turned. It's where a king was killed, and his victor claimed the throne. October 14th, 1066. We know what happened here on this day, thanks to this. The Bayer Tapestry. A carefully preserved illustrated record of events. It shows the main players. Harold, the newly crowned Anglo-Saxon King of England, and his challenger, William. Duke of Normandy. William claimed the previous king had promised him the crown. So, he assembled an army and prepared to sail to England to fight King Harold for the throne. But a storm thwarted his plans. Meanwhile, Harold discovered that a Viking invasion had landed in the north another threat to his crown. So he raced to fight them. In France, William waited for the right conditions to sail across the channel to England. The weather cleared. He seized his chance. Two hundred and fifty miles north, Harold had defeated the Vikings. Now, hearing of William's arrival, his army sped south. At nine o'clock in the morning, on this hill, William's Norman army were ready to do battle with Harold's Anglo-Saxon men. The stage was set, and up for grabs, England itself. On October 14, 1066, William of Normandy stood ready for battle at the base of a hill. The high ground belonged to King Harold of England and his Anglo-Saxon army. Here, on this hilltop, the fate of England would be decided.